All right, guys, we made it. The good live-action Spider-Man movies now officially outnumber the bad ones. I liked Spider-Man Far From Home a lot. Perhaps not quite as much as its predecessor, Spider-Man Homecoming, and definitely not as much as last year's animated film Into the Spider-Verse, but still quite a lot. The best stuff in the movie is the inner conflict of Peter Parker. The first half of this film is almost more of a teen drama featuring Spider-Man than it is an out-and-out Spider-Man film. There's a lot of great material where these two aspects of the character are clashing and getting in the way of one another, and it's done very well. Tom Holland is still spectacular in the role, easily the best version of Peter that we've had in live action. You're saying there's a multiverse? Like Homecoming, Spider-Man Home Sweet Home predominantly revolves around Peter's struggle to live up to the expectations set out for him by surrogate father figure Tony Stark who now seems to have totally eclipsed the voice in the back of my head, great power, great responsibility role typically reserved for Uncle Ben and most other versions of Spider-Man. While in the last film, Peter was impatient to graduate from fighting street-level crimes to instead go off to play with the big boys, this time we see him struggle to try and keep one foot on the ground while being expected by everyone else to prioritize being a superhero following the events of Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. You got gifts, Parker. But we have a job to do. Are you going to step up or not? It's a logical continuation for the character and his role within the shared universe that still manages to stay in keeping with the boilerplate Spider-Man character conflict and themes while still feeling like fresh new territory for him on the big screen. I'm just a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Bitch, please, you've been to space. I do wish, however, that the scope of this movie had been just a little bit smaller than it is, which I think it totally could have been without changing too much of the story. One of the things I appreciated most about Homecoming was how the stakes in that film never really rose goes above a guy trying to steal a bunch of technology so he could make some money. Like, it totally makes sense why you wouldn't bother calling in the Avengers to stop him. Spider-Man Home for the Holidays, however, does not have that excuse. This movie is ten times the size. It's like... It's a huge film. It's overwhelmingly huge. It's one of the surprisingly few movies in this very large franchise where my suspension of disbelief was broken by the fact that there are at least 50 or 60 other super people running around in this world who should be available. The fact that Spider-Man is the only veteran Avenger being recruited by Nick Fury and the remnants of S.H.I.E.L.D. to shoulder this responsibility is absurd, and the movie is at least self-aware enough to lampshade that, seen here in the trailers. There's gotta be someone else you can use. What about Thor? Off-world. Captain Marvel, unavailable. But that's all it is, lampshading. Realistically, Fury and his team absolutely could have and should have been able to find another Avenger or two or five to help out with this situation. Like, come on, what's Bruce up to? Or Rhodey, or Pepper, or Scarlet Witch, or Ant-Man, or Falcon, or Bucky, or Long, or Valkyrie, or Black Panther, or any of their hundreds of other sorcerer as Guardian and Wakandan buddies that we see in the battle at the end of Endgame. I suppose it's more of a nitpick than anything else, but it still bugged me. Most of the other characters who are here, though, are utilized very well. Zendaya is great in this movie. She gets a whole lot more to do here than she did in Homecoming, where her character pretty much only existed as a running gag, followed by a punchline at the end of the film where her nickname is revealed to be MJ, which is still a tad confusing to me since this character is clearly not meant to be Mary Jane Watson. Her real name is Michelle, so I don't really get the point of calling her MJ, but whatever, it doesn't really matter. She and Holland have a lot of believable on-screen chemistry in this film playing a couple of teenagers who are both socially awkward but in drastically different ways. I'm looking forward to seeing how this relationship continues to play out in the future. We've always kind of been, I think, the, um, the outcasts and I think that they find and they actually can appreciate each other for all the weird, quirky awkwardness because that's just who they are and they like it about each other which is really, really sweet I think and um, I don't know, I think we've, we've done awkward really well. Yeah, you look really pretty. And therefore I have value. No, no, that's not I'm right. messing with you. <laughs> you look pretty too. This film also does a good job of organically rehoming Jon Favreau's Happy Hogan from the Iron Man series over to the Spider-Man series. This is the first time in six films the character has appeared in that he's been given any kind of actual development and is used as much more than comic relief. I don't think Tony would have done what he did if he didn't know that you were going to be here after he was gone. I also thoroughly enjoyed Jake Gyllenhaal's performance in this film as Mysterio. He's a pretty mysterious guy, so I can't say too much about him, but I will say that I really enjoyed the way that this film juxtaposes his relationship with Peter and his role in the movie to that of Tony Stark in Spider-Man Homecoming. If there is one major character in the film that I found somewhat lacking, it's Peter's best friend slash man in the chair, Ned Leeds. Now that Spider-Man is one of the big dogs, Ned has essentially nothing left to do in the plot besides just sort of hang around 
around in the background with the other handful of Peter's classmates, which would be fine except that they still seem to be insisting he's a main character and has put in way too much of the screen time with this running gag throughout the movie that's kind of funny at first but way overstays its welcome, and is especially annoying since that's all he really does in the movie. Overall though, like I said, I did very much enjoy Spider-Man Home is Where the Heart Is. It's a worthy successor to all of the films it's been tasked with following up, and does so without ever really feeling encumbered by the fact that it is the follow-up to multiple different films. I think I'd compare it positively in that way to Captain America Civil War. Also, I'm obviously not going to say why, but for the love of God, make sure you don't leave the theater before catching both of the post credit scenes. The first of which makes me even more excited for the next Spider-Man movie than I would have already been otherwise, and the second hints at what will likely be, at least in part, the next major story arc for the larger MCU. For now though, if you like this video, help me out by hitting that like button, subscribing for more in the future, and ringing the bell to stay up to date on all my future videos. Let me know down in the comments any of your thoughts on Spider-Man Home Home on the Range, and check out some of the other great stuff I've got up here on my channel. As always, thanks so much to all of you guys for watching, and take care.